Right, uh, so uh, what, this, what I was interested in was <coughs> a different approach to wholeness um, than given by the system theory. Um, <coughs> my concern with this arose out of my experience as a postgraduate research student in physics at Birkbeck College, University of London, early in the 1960s. I put the name in Birkbeck College because they, they closed the physics department down there. And this is the cuts and all the politics. And it's a great shame because it was a small department with some of the most extraordinary people. Um, one man has actually worked with Schrodinger in Berlin, and heavens only knows what, I mean, incredible people there. And uh, they closed it down for internal politics and so on and that. So in my book, I'm going to make sure I mention it. <laughs> uh, where I worked on the problem of wholeness, in the quantum theory. This is 1962, 1963. It's a very long time ago. Um, it had begun, I, I, I keep saying, they say that I'm very old, and I keep saying to them they should get someone else to come and do this job because it's not, I say, it's not nice for these young people to come and have an old bloke like me. And they ought to have a young, with it person. And I've told them, I say, you must get someone next year who's young and with it and exciting and so on and that. But each year they say, no, no, you come back, you come back, and so on. That. Uh, but you, you should have a go at them, tell them to get, to get on with the job. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it had become clear that a fundamentally new way of thinking was needed for quantum physics, even though such a possibility had been explicitly denied by Niels Bohr in what was referred to as the Copenhagen interpretation of the quantum theory which had become the most widely accepted view among physicists as a result of Bohr's extraordinary persuasiveness. It's more a question of social psychology than physics. He just bullied people into agreeing with him. Um, <coughs> but he was a genial bully, a benevolent bully is the word I want. Um, so he wasn't a nasty bully, he was a benevolent bully. But you know, he wouldn't give up until people said he was right. Um, and uh, he reduced Schrodinger to tears and uh, Schrodinger took to his bed, and uh, Schrodinger went to Copenhagen, and uh, it reduced him to tears, and uh, he went ill, went to bed, and Bohr came and sat on the bottom of the bed, and still went on until Schrodinger said, yes, 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 I agree with you, ah, this is good. And <laughs> another famous story is that um, uh, Bohr had a student, he, was, he, was, he, he discussed everything to Bohr, in these rather laborious sentences. And he had research students, and the research student got married. And he was on the train, going on honeymoon, and he, the train was, in those days, trains pulled very slowly out of stations. That's why you could run down and <laughs> jump on the last carriage. Um, and Bohr is running down the platform, still discussing this physics paper <laughs> with this student through the open window as the train's going up. Here's the kind of man he was. And so he was very persuasive. And he persuaded everybody that, in fact, he said the point about quantum physics is that something new has happened here and there is an irreducible wholeness at that level. And now he was the first person to introduce the idea of wholeness into physics. And I say into physics because actually it could have been done other ways. And as what we now know from the history and philosophy of science is that very often a great deal happens in which ideas which look like they have been discovered in science have actually been introduced into the science from outside. Mm -hmm. This is now, it's called the historicity of scientific knowledge. <coughs> <coughs> and various ideas about wholeness bore actually introduced from the wider cultural milieu into, into the physics and insisted it could only be seen in this way. So he felt that there was this irreducible wholeness in quantum physics. Because you see, with the quantum, um, when a quantum of energy is absorbed, it's an all or nothing thing. A quantum is never half absorbed or three quarters absorbed. It isn't all it is. So there's this, this uh, discontinuity, this indivisibility there. And many other things happen, like with the famous two slit interference experiment and so on with a single photon, where it, can, it has to go through both slits but can't divide so it can only go through one state, and all that kind of thing. So there's a, a kind of irreducible wholeness. Now Bohr said that wholeness is an irrationality so far as physics is concerned. And this has been completely misunderstood. 
I actually did research on this. The work, work I did was actually, when I went to work with, with Bohm, I, I, I persuaded him to take me on. He took, he took me on because he said he detected I was interested in ideas, I had a feeling for ideas, but he didn't think I'd do very well at physics. He was completely right. Um, the, the, the life of ideas continues with me to this day. Uh, the physics was a failure. Um, but that's all right. I got a great deal from my con being in contact with, with him. But I thought, well, I'll carry, carry favours you do when you're young. I'll say, something, um, I'll say something negative about Bohr. Because what happened was, uh, there'd been, in those days with Bohm, there was a very strong reaction to him. And there'd been a, 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 an article or a letter in the New Scientist virtually saying that Bohr, Bohm should keep his mouth shut. And he shouldn't be saying the things he was saying because he said the Copenhagen interpretation was right and so on and that. And three of us, had, I wasn't working with him then, three of us had actually written a letter in which we, we said how, ironically, said how extremely glad we were to hear the, see that this objection to Bohm had been done. Because, you know, if things continue as they were, next thing you know, someone will be saying that the Earth actually moves. And so on. It was a sarcastic letter. Anyway, they published it, and that's how I sort of got. It. Anyway, then I, eventually I went, I went to go and work with him. So I thought, well, the thing to do is to get on the right side of him by saying something negative about Bohr. So, crap, as you do when you're young, and um, so I did. And he said, Oh no, 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 no! You mustn't think like that. Bohr was a very remarkable man with a very deep understanding of the problems of quantum physics much, much deeper than even his followers know. Now, many of these followers, Bohm, Bohm had a huge amount of trouble. We now know politically the various people <coughs> in, tried to get him chucked out of all sorts of things because of his views on, on the physics. Um, but he had this huge respect for Bohr. And he said, what you should do is you should start off by trying to really understand Bohr. Now, this is the man who Bohm's work was saying was wrong. And he said, you must start <coughs> by trying to really understand him. He's a very deep thinker. So that was a real learning experience for me. Um, and it stuck with me ever since. Um, because now I hear people saying things like about uh, certain philosophers, oh, that's obviously nonsense. And say, no, if you think it's nonsense, he would have seen it's nonsense. And therefore, he can't possibly have been saying that. This has stood me in good stead all through my life. Mm. And time and again, you think, oh, good Lord, fancy saying that. Ah, well, if you can see that, he can certainly see it. So he's not saying that. He's saying something else. What is it? And then you get into things in a deeper way. Mm. So that experience has lasted me throughout my life. And I, all the time, I, I work on that basis. Of course, I fall foul of it all the time. But then you, you pick yourself up and say, ah, it's that kind of thing. Now, let's go into it. So I went into Bohr, and this is where I found that when Bohr talked about the quantum as an irrationality entering into physics, he had in mind irrational numbers in mathematics, and not irrationality in the romantic sense. People say, wow, the irrational has come into physics. Wow, that's fantastic. No, he meant irrational numbers, because he said, point to think about this, um, if you have rational numbers, going back to the original thing, if you have a triangle, side is right angle triangle, one and one, the sides, then the length of the hypotenuse, which you can see in front of you, is a number which you can't actually calculate. It's the square root of two, which if you try to calculate it, never stops. So it's a kind of funny, kind of leaky number. This, as you know, was a great shock. Now, how they coped with this, the Greeks, they had rational numbers. A rational is a ratio null number. It's a ratio. Uh, that's what it means. So, 3 over 4 is a rational number. 3 over 4 can be put in decimals, 0 0.75. 0 0.75 finish. It's a, it's a ratio, 3 over 4. It's a rational number. A ratio. So, what you then found was, there are these numbers which ought to be the same, and cannot be expressed as a ratio. You can't express root 2 as a ratio. 
If you try it, it goes 1 over 1 plus 2 over 1 plus 2 over 1 plus 2, and it goes on and on and on and on, it's called a continued fraction. It's quite interesting to write it out on the page, because then you see what the problem is. Now, how Bohr was very impressed by how the Greeks coped with this. He said they simply accommodated it by calling it a new kind of number, which was an irrational number, and working with it directly. And that's what they did. And so it's a, it's a, a non-rational number. And he was very impressed by this. And he said that is what we must do in quantum physics. The wholeness, there is no concept of wholeness. He believed you could not have a, an adequate concept of wholeness. That all you could do was to approximate it. And therefore it functioned in physics as in irrationality. And so we have to find ways of using the existing concepts in such a way that if we're careful about it, we, we never go wrong, as it were. And that all you can do is accommodate this by using the existing concepts, as the Greeks accommodated the irrational numbers by using the ordinary numbers they had. And that is what he meant when he said that with quantum physics, an irrationality entered into physics. Of course, if you didn't know that's what he meant, you would think he meant something quite different, which has excited no end of New Age people, of course, who are simply barking up the wrong tree completely. So, this was what Bohr had said. You can only accommodate wholeness in terms of the concepts we have. There cannot be a new concept of wholeness. And that's what Bohm disagreed with and tried to show there could be. And he did this, first of all, in 1952 with a paper in which he introduced something called the quantum potential. And that paper actually was later... He, it was the basis of, uh, basis of a great deal of the later work he did, even though he actually wanted to do it in a new way and differently. But I won't go into that. Um, uh, it doesn't matter. So there we are. That's it. But David Bohm Bohm believed that it was possible to develop new concepts of wholeness. He pointed to examples which he said could function as templates for a new way of thinking about wholeness. One of these was the hologram, which at the time in question was a technological innovation. Now I remember this. I remember working with one of the first lasers, which we hired from a firm called Bradley's. You really need to write that down, incidentally, that it was hired from a firm called Bradley's in 1963. Um, and <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, they were tricky because they, they had these internal mirrors that had to be perfectly aligned. Uh, I managed to misalign the mirrors, which took several hours to get the thing to work again. It was terrible. Um, anyway, uh, okay, uh, the hologram. It was, uh, yeah, it was this appealed to the imagination, because unlike <coughs> a photographic plate, where each <coughs> <coughs> each point on the image of the plate corresponds approximately to a point on the object. A point on the object would give rise to a point on the plane. Roughly speaking, it'll be a small area, okay? So each point on the object you're photographing will produce a different point on the plate. Photographic plate. It's a film. But in those days, everything was done with old cameras in which you put plates in. Did you know about that? Glass plates with the photo thing on. So I still talk about photographic plates because I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's stupid as this, because people who wonder what on earth I'm talking about, they got these cameras. Well, first of all, they had digital cameras. My wife's got one of those. And then, now you don't have a camera, you have a mobile phone. Um, so, this is beyond me. I'm still <laughs> with photographic plates. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, when I was at the University of Hull, we had this call for x <laughs> X-ray crystallography, yeah, of course, and uh, they got this particular man to go to demonstrate, oh, go to demonstrate photographic techniques for X-ray crystallography. How to use this camera? To put these plates in, and this is the way things were. And he said, he said, unfortunately, I'm going to have to do this demonstration in the dark 
the raw sweet in there in those because otherwise the plates were raw. I mean, this is the sort of thing that people would do in those days, and then carry on. Say so carry on, and then you say when you have opened the packet of plates in the dark, there's a, there's a rough side and a shiny side. You've got to get it in the right way around. You say I'm going to pass some, <laughs> I'm going to pass some plates around, and I want you to feel it. And so he did pass them, and I have with me some cheese biscuits, which. <laughs> Roughly, just has of these plates. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I put a hundred cheese biscuits in between the plates. <laughs> and he picked it up. There's a crunch. <laughs> and he said, Someone seems to like biscuits. <laughs> Of course, it was all in the dark, they never knew what it was. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, you can't do that with your the camera and your mobile phone, anyway. <laughs> so, here we are. The, back to the hologram. Uh, right, this imagination. Yeah, so instead of a point on the object, producing a point on the photograph. <coughs> with the hologram, it, <coughs> <coughs> each part of the plate, each small region of the plate, contains information about the whole of the object. So the whole object is actually in each, each small region of the plate. It's completely different. So instead of localised parts, with a hologram, the part of the object, sorry, the whole object is present in each part. And therefore each part is distributed throughout the whole hologram. So the whole is in each part, and each part is distributed throughout the whole. It's a completely different picture. And to use the language which Bohm later adopted, adopted, the whole is enfolded in the part, and each part is enfolded in the whole. Now these ideas of Bohm's encouraged some of us to think that the wholeness <coughs> of human organisations, at whatever level, could not be understood adequately by means of the systems approach, because something more holographic was needed. We needed a holographic picture. Uh, later on, of course, not entirely after that, people got keen on this holographic thing. And there's a whole book published called The Holographic Paradigm, and it became very, people got very interested in California and so on that the holographic paradigm, but this was really done independently of that, more completely. We didn't know about that until later, um, and we were using it as a kind of, oh, a template for thinking in a new way. We weren't taking it seriously, in, literally in the sense of there's a hologram in it. Later on people sort of did work on the brain, the holographic brain, in which they thought that the brain was some kind of hologram. And so. It's not what we were doing, we were simply taking this as a template for a way of thinking about wholeness. One of the areas in which we were working required the design of an attitude survey for the preliminary stage of gathering information prior to the introduction of an organisational change. Uh, with a, with a big organisation, uh, there were several organisations. We adopted the philosophy that each person in their role in an organisation is in fact an expression of the organisation as a whole. So that we could say the whole organisation comes to expression to some degree through the role of each person in that organisation. So if the whole comes to expression through its parts, then the way to understand the whole is through the way it is expressed in these parts. Instead of trying to stand back to get an overview, see how the parts could be made to fit together into a whole, which is all too often <coughs> what seemed to be the outcome, if not the intention, of the systems approach. In practical terms, if the way into the whole is through the parts, each of which is an expression of the whole, instead of trying to get a total overview of the whole, then this meant talking to everyone in the organisation, 
Because whoever they were, the whole was coming into expression through them, no matter how partially. And I like the word, you probably picked it up from the paper, partially is partially. It's partially also means partially. I quite like that word. <coughs> Along with ubiquitous. Encountering the whole in this way felt like entering into another dimension of the organisation, but a concrete dimension, compared with the usual way of thinking, which tended to seem very abstract. Our practical task, as we interpreted it, was to devise surveys and other materials which would facilitate this holographic approach to the wholeness of the organisation, in which we can begin developing the capacity to see from within the whole of the organisation in which we work and live. That was the idea. Uh, and it's interesting, because one of the things that people did to pick up about this, is it, 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 I talked about it like <coughs> the organisation became like a dimension, but it was concrete. Whereas when you had uh, people called management consultants, organisational consultants, what they did seemed to be very abstract, because they always had a scheme. There was a model. And they applied that model to the, to the organisation, to the people. There. And they enframed, you Heidegger's term, they enframed them in terms of this model. And in interviews and, and so on, that they would talk about people in terms of that model to those people. And were trying to force them into that framework. Mm -hmm. And all the time, people were saying, but no, it's not like that, it's not like that. But they wanted it to be like that, because they had brought a framework from outside. And we were trying to find the kind of living expression of the wholeness of all the organisation from within. This wasn't easy, but this is what we were trying to do. And it was this holographic picture that we had in mind, which was uh, behind it, um, which really came out of this, this alternative approach that Bloom was trying to take to quantum physics. So it was quite interesting. Uh, now, one day... I was trying to describe the idea behind this work to Brian Lewis, who was Professor of Educational Systems at the Open University. The Open University had just begun, and we were also doing some work with them. And I mentioned Brian Lewis, I think he died quite soon afterwards, because he did me a tremendous, one of those things, he did me a tremendous favour, he did something for me, which I'm going to mention, which really has affected me from then onwards. Um, I was describing it to him, he told me that it sounded to him very similar to what is called the hermeneutic circle. <coughs> and he suggested that I looked into the philosophy of hermeneutics. He actually said that there's now you can do this now, he said, because there is now, for the first time, a readable book in English on it. Um, one only, this is, was published in 1969, we're now in 1970, 71, and 70. And he... Um, it was by Richard Palmer under the imposing title of Hermeneutics Interpretation Theory in Schleiermacher, Diltai, Heidegger and Gardner. Not exactly a turn on for most people. <laughs> I got hold of that book and it was an extraordinary experience. I read it. And I remember I was on a, a, a river back around a picnic with the young children one day and I said to my wife, this is the most extraordinary thing. I know nothing about this and I'm reading this book. And I feel as if I'm coming home. I can't understand it. I feel at home with this and I don't know how. And that, that was an extraordinary thing for me, that was. Um, and that, that was Brian Lewis did that for me. And so uh, I, uh, I owe him a debt, which is, I think he died. Uh, anyway, never mind. Um, this philosophy arose in the first place in connection with questions about how we understand written works whether they be scriptural, philosophical, literary, historical, or legal. But it became apparent that hermeneutics applies more widely to all forms of expression, and hence to any kind of cultural expression from the simplest to the most complex. Put simply, if somewhat abstractly, the hermeneutic circle arises from the circumstance that, in order to understand the whole, we must understand the parts. But in order to understand the parts, we must understand the whole. It became immediately obvious immediately that the holographic approach to wholeness, with which it was intended to replace the systems approach, had a form which is very similar 
to that of the hermeneutic circle. And hence that what we thought of as a holographic survey could equally well be thought of as a hermeneutic survey. This opened the door to the possibility that systems theory could be replaced by hermeneutic thinking in the context of human organisations. There was an explosion of activity as some of us explored the hermeneutic dimension of the organisation <coughs> in as many ways as we could find, which included one occasion when I found myself giving a seminar on the hermeneutics of the organisation to the somewhat bemused management of IBM. Uh, <coughs> what excited me particularly about this was that I realised, because uh, hermeneutics is connected with phenomenology, and I realised that what this meant was that there was a whole alternative philosophical approach to organisations. We didn't need to talk about holograms, a technological thing in the background in physics. And we dropped all of that. We could say we're taking a hermeneutic approach, which brought in the whole, uh, <coughs> the whole attitude of European philosophy, continental philosophy, in the 20th century, and saying you can look at organisations through this philosophy instead of through the analytical philosophy that's come with the systems approach, and which is more Anglo-American. So it felt we'd actually put our finger on something that was very deep, potentially. Of course, in truth, it all turned out to be a lot more difficult than we imagined, and everything went wrong, um, and uh, as things do in life, um, we all ended up going in different directions and so on. Um, but that's very interesting. There was a group of people, and it was just extraordinary for the time. And then it just... Boom. So, <coughs> there we are. But I do find, nowadays, things are said, which... There's this book by Presence. Do you know the book Presence? Organisational Change. Sharma, Senga, Sharma, Jaworski and Flowers. No, you don't know? Forget it. Um... Never mind. Is it good? Well, in some ways yes, in some ways no. It's, it's very good in the beginning because it mentions my work. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I couldn't resist that. Uh, <laughs> but I, they were very taken with this paper on the whole um, and so on and that. Um, and so they, they used that. There are things in there which are rem reminiscent of the kind of thing we were trying to do 30 sort of years before, but never mind that. Right. <coughs> now, this interest in hermeneutics led me quite naturally into phenomenology, the most important and influential movement in European philosophy in the 20th century. Hermeneutics as the philosophy of meaning and understanding was transformed by phenomenology first through Heidegger and then by Gadamer. But getting into phenomenology isn't easy. It's a philosophy which has the effect of seeming strange and yet familiar at the same time. Phenomenology seems to take the ground away from under our feet, whilst at the same time giving us the sense of being where we have always been, only now recognising it as if as if for the first time. It's hard to catch hold of because it's like trying to catch something as it's happening and which is over before we can do so. We're trying to catch lived experience, that's why. It can perhaps be described most simply as stepping back into where we already are. This means shifting the focus of attention within experience away from what is experienced, into the experiencing of it. So if we consider seeing, for example, this means we have to step back from what is seen into the seeing of what is seen. We don't... It's, you, I, I, it gets a bit cumbersome because I have to say it properly. You don't step back from what is seen into the seeing because there's no seeing without something that's seen. So it's a dynamic thing. So you, our attention, as it is, because of the directionality of experience, is always fo <coughs> 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 
focus on the end result, what is seen. I see, I see the table, what is seen. Uh, the, the nature of experience is to always be drawn out. So that's the intrinsic directionality. So you have to now, within the experience, shift the focus of attention by drawing back from what is seen into the seeing of what is seen. This can, that's what phenomenology does. Something to be practised. Like many others, I felt drawn towards phenomenology and yet frustrated by it because it seemed to be elusive and evident. No, no, it seemed to be both evident and elusive at the same time. However, by good fortune, <coughs> the stirring of my interest in phenomenology happened to coincide with the founding of the British Society for Phenomenology by Wolf Mays. This gave me the opportunity to meet and learn from practitioners, which included not only academic philosophers, but also psychiatrists, sociologists and others who used the phenomenological approach in their work. <coughs> it was like breathing in an atmosphere of phenomenology. And under these circumstances, it wasn't long before I began to catch the phenomenological way of seeing. <coughs> in fact, I had a remarkable introduction to it because I haven't mentioned this, it's going too far, but... <coughs> uh, my wife spotted an advert in the back of the New Scientist for a conference on phenomenology and sociology at City University in uh, London. And it was a, a residential... They had a, and she, uh, she persuaded me to go. I don't like residential things, uh, so I, I tend not to go. Uh, but she persuaded me to go, which I'm very grateful for. And uh, I went along to this. And uh, there were various speakers, and this society then just started. And there were people from all over the place. And there were, there, I mean, there were people from the north of England as well as the south. Mm. And there were big blokes who, from Manchester and uh, Belfast who worked in social administration and they were doing the phenomenology of social administration right in the middle of a place like Belfast where there's always trouble going on and they were very practical men they were, they were sort of people who drank pints of beer and ate pork pies not the sort of people some of us would like to mix with and so, so it was a real mix of people and <clears throat> the key, one of the key speakers was a man oh god it's coming again a very famous Frenchman uh, and I keep, I just keep forgetting his name, Raymond Aron, and very famous, and I only knew that he'd written a two-volume work on the history of sociology. Anyway, he was a key speaker, and it turned out he couldn't come. And there was lots of jokes about fog in channel, continent cut off, and that sort of thing. And um, he couldn't come, and they said, well, we've got a problem here. Um, is there anyone who'd like to volunteer, and it could be more than one person, to, do, make, to, to make a contribution and really we won't expect a polished thing or anything like that. And I've no idea why. Uh, but I, I, I put my hand up. Fortunately, so did someone else. Uh, and uh, he was a mathematician. I, I thought, I'll tell him about all this stuff on the hermeneutics we've been doing in practice, you see. Because I was so full of this stuff. Well, of course, they were very delighted, but then I was later I realised the enormity of what I'd done. Anyway, uh, it had this effect that um, everybody was very open to me because I'd done this. And so in the bar at night, um, everyone was talking, and it's all these conversations about phenomenology with these guys who were doing it. It was incredible. And, and <coughs> I, I then went at about 11 o'clock and sat down and thought what I could do at 9 o'clock the next morning. And uh, I... I, I uh, I did this on a piece of paper folded over, a sheet of A4, and it was folded over into bits. It was ridiculous. And I just scribbled this down. I was in quite a, f a flood, really. And I did this the next morning, and it, it, it worked extremely well. They loved it. They asked me to go to their conference and give a full talk, which I did, and that also worked. So I was very lucky, but through this business, I actually got in and met all these people, and then I was known immediately... And people were very open to me because I'd done this. The point about the story is that I didn't know who Raymond Aron was. 
Later on, I discovered Raymond Aron is the man who introduced Jean-Paul Sartre to phenomenology. <laughs> in a very famous encounter with Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir in a cafe where Aron had just come back from Berlin and said to Sartre, you've really got to get with this new philosophy, phenomenology. With this, you can do the, the, the philosophy of street lamps and beer glasses. And he says, the story goes, Sartre went white because it was exactly what he was looking for. And Aron then substituted for Sartre for, in his teaching job in La Havre for a year so he could go to Berlin and study phenomen phenomenology directly. And I had actually substituted for this man. I mean, when I look back on it, it's frightening. You know, absolutely frightening. And it just shows, when you're young and foolish, sometimes it really works. You know? Because nowadays, I wouldn't dare put my hand up for anything. Now I'm experienced. I wouldn't put my hand up for a thing. I just keep, just keep them like that, whatever that's going on, you know. So, uh, well, obviously, because of this, the effect was, I, I really got into phenomenology. Um, and, and there was tremendous openness towards me because I'd done this. And so I, I felt it as sort of, it was like, as I said, like breathing in it and so on. Now I mention all this because this kind of thing doesn't, not the way things happen these days. And all that's gone and the world's changed. And it doesn't work that way anymore. <coughs> and that you, you, that's a kind of way of getting together like that. And most people think that what you do is you have to have an academic course. You're going to study at university and you're going to read the books and you're going to have an academic thing. And then they say, oh, well, you know, phenomenal, that's academic, isn't it? That's intellectual. It's not like that. When you, in those days, when you met the people who were practicing stuff in life, there was nothing academic. Well, there were academics there, but they all tended to be a bit visionary as well. Um, and that's why I have to get across somehow, that's why I want at the beginning of this book, that for me, this is how things have happened. <laughs>